Lord Jesus Christ, please be seated. May the holy names of Jesus and Mary be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus said to them, I have compassion on the multitude, for behold, they have been with me for three days and have nothing to eat. The Gospel account today of the multiplication of the loaves and the fish reveals two hidden strands that we must explore. Firstly, as we noted two weeks ago in the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, we were taught again and also today to trust in the divine providence of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Question then, what is this divine providence? Divine providence is the governance of God by which he, with wisdom and care, cares and directs all things in the universe. The doctrine of divine providence asserts that God is in complete control, dear brothers and sisters of Christ, of all things. He is sovereign over the universe as a whole, the physical world, the affairs of nations, human destiny, human successes and failures, and the protection of his people and life, and even in control of the dis this direction of the pandemic coronavirus. The doctrine stands in direct opposition to the idea that the universe is governed by what some people call chance or by fate. Through divine providence, God accomplishes his holy will. To ensure that his purposes are fulfilled, God governs the affairs of men and works through the natural order of things. The laws of nature, we can say, are nothing more than God's work in the universe. Servant of God, Don Delindo, who was a holy priest from Naples, writes in his commentary today that a great multitude gathered around Jesus Christ and hung from his very lips, forgetting even to provide for their own sustenance. They had been following him for three days and exhausted all their supplies so that to return to their homes would have been too difficult. What did Jesus have to talk about in order to attract people in this way? Well, we know our Lord certainly didn't promise temple goods, but raised their minds to eternal goods. And his word was so full of life that it raised those souls out of the pure, the poor human circle and filled them with such spiritual happiness. No one could speak better of him than the eternal joys because he was God and he was immersed in their beatific vision. Every word of him, therefore, was a dart of peace, of love and of life that satisfied each soul. The place where the people had gathered had become what we can say like a piece of paradise. This is what happens when our Lord speaks to you and to me. It is perfectly opposite what we see in the world today. The leaders of the world speak only of an earthly paradise, which feeds the carnal desires of the flesh. He who has plenty wants, he who has plenty always wants more, because his reference point is himself and not the Lord. His soul will only be satisfied in God. Jesus Christ still calls the people around him today to draw them strongly toward the desire of eternal good, goods. He calls them around his altar, where he gives them spiritual satisfaction. The more we live around our Lord, the less we feel the need for what is material. The more we love his divine heart, the more our heart is filled with love. Those who follow Jesus Christ with fidelity never lack what is necessary even for their bodily life. St. Ambrose adds in his commentary that the Lord is the dispenser of all things. As Jesus divides the food as his will is to give to all and to deny no one. What a pain for many poor today, deprived of what is necessary, Jesus Christ and living in a state of moral darkness and sin. 
When we live far from God, there is only starvation, spiritual starvation and despair. Where can we find this divine providence then in the midst of our lives? We can ask ourselves this important question today. Trust in divine providence at the foot of the cross. The foot of the cross gazing through the heart of Mary into the five wounds of Jesus Christ. What about the wound on the head of our Saviour we can contemplate which was pierced with thorns? Not just once but three times. How can we imagine the violence of the executioners who ripped off the garments of our Lord in his passion, leaving thorns stuck in his very skull? How can we imagine the acute pain of Jesus Christ when the crown was repressed onto his head on top of those remaining thorns? How can we imagine the long deep thorns piercing not only his head but his eyes and even the back of his neck and even into his mouth? How can we imagine the seven times that our Lord and Saviour spoke from the cross? He had to lift himself up to inflate his lungs before speaking, thus forcing the crown of thorns deeper into his skull. This was the love of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, for you and for me. So we can also reflect on the chief virtue the gospel is teaching us today which is patience we must wait patiently for God to show his providence in all our lives let us wait then with the patience of Jesus Christ ridiculed on the cross let us wait with the patience the great patience of the blessed virgin Mary standing at the foot of the cross let us stand firm like the Israelites who were confronted by the attacking Egyptian armies. Remember when Moses said, stay firm, be patient, and wait on the Lord. God in our lives will always allow us to be tested, to test our patience and to, show, to allow us to show our fidelity towards him. Look, let us look then at the second point of importance then in the Gospel today. This beautiful prefigurement of the Holy Eucharist in the multiplication of the loaves. Jesus provides nothing other than himself in the Holy Eucharist. Where do we find Calvary today but at the sacrifice of the Holy Mass? This is not a banquet or a meal or a representation of what happened 2,000 years ago, but an unbloody representation of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ on the cross. The first Holy Mass was not the Last Supper, as many believe in this Protestant mindset today, which tells us that the Mass is but a memorial of the banquet and a common sharing of the banquet table. This is false. The, whole, the first Holy Mass offered by Jesus Christ was at his cross at Calvary and his own death. This is why we are here, now gathered together, through God's grace in this moment, about to emerge and immerse ourselves in the Passion of Christ at the Holy Mass. Jesus Christ not only comes into time and space 2,000 years ago as the Word made flesh, no, he gives his self to us, not only does he give himself his blessed mother, the sublime key of salvation, but Jesus Christ gives himself to us as a living sacrifice, his own flesh and blood in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Do we realize that Jesus Christ is really present in the most blessed sacrament in the Eucharist? If we did, we surely would kneel down to receive his majesty and to prostrate ourselves before his immensity. This then is the root of our lack of trust today. The root cause of all of the evils in the world today we speak of, nothing other than the lack of belief in the real presence of Jesus Christ on our altars. We need, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, simplicity. We must return in this country our Lady's Diary to the basics of our faith. Why? Because 
as we said, most Catholics, even most Catholics, have lost faith in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the most blessed sacrament. I mentioned before that this was my own experience. After 30 years going to Mass as a practicing Catholic, I was one time in a Holy Mass in St. Mary's Cathedral in Newcastle. After the Mass, somebody said to me, wait patiently and our Lord, we will have a, a, we'll have a, a blessed sacrament procession around the church. I said to him, I didn't know what he meant. It hit me like a knockout punch. The blessed sacrament was really Jesus Christ. I never knew it and I'd been going to Mass for 30 years. Do we realize also the magnificence of the Holy Eucharist? Do you realize that one Holy Communion, if you are well disposed, can make you a saint? Saint Alphonsus Liguori, in his discourses on the Mass and the Office, wrote, and this is magnificent, he said, A single Mass gives more honor to God than can ever be given to him by all the prayers and the austerities of the saints. All the labors and fatigues of the apostles, all the torments of the martyrs, and all the adorations of the seraphim and of the mother of God. This is the wonder and the sublime mystery and magnificence of the Holy Mass. Let our hearts therefore be one with God, so that we may stand one day with she who trusted in God in the most perfect way. She who stood alone at the foot of the cross and was the true icon of faith. She who trusted without a shadow of doubt and she who gave more love and more glory to God than the rest of heaven combined. We speak of Our Lady, Mother of the Eucharist, the Immaculate One in the place one day in heaven we will be with her, God willing, where eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of man what great things God has prepared for them, for them that love him. Amen. May the names, holy names of Jesus and Mary be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father,